Welcome back to the Tony Hernandez Show. Today is Saturday, August 17th. I can't believe it. We're almost at the end of summer here. Labor Day is just around the corner. You're going to be bringing your kids back to school in no time. And uh, it's been a great summer so far, though. It's a beautiful day today. Uh, next week, it's supposed to be especially beautiful in Minnesota. And uh, today, I spent the time at the Energy for Life Walkathon uh, to raise awareness for mitochondrial disease. It was in Bloomington, Minnesota. And there was a whole bunch of people that showed up. And I was there supporting Melissa Kiefer, who I mentioned uh, about last show and uh, her mother representative Andrea Kiefer and, and a whole bunch of people went out there and they raised uh, quite a few uh, dollars too uh, for the cause to find a cure for mitochondrial disease and, and those things I really realized the value in it because I didn't know much about the disease a, a week ago and because of this event because of going there and talking to people with direct experience I was able to, to learn more about it uh, and mitochondrial disease affects uh, millions of people across this country and it also uh, is similar to cancer in terms of there's different uh, forms and different symptoms and everything of the like. So uh, it's a good thing to raise awareness for and uh, we hope and pray that someday there will be a cure. And uh, with that, I'm going to bring on uh, Sam Wayne Pierce. He's going to be joining us here. Sam wasn't here last week. And uh, Sam, how are you? Great, Tony. And hello, White Bear Lake. <laughs> hello, White Bear Lake, Minnesota. How is the weather out in New York right now? Weather is good, but uh, I liked your intro that uh, that summer is, is coming to an end because for me, I, I like fall the best. You uh, like fall? I, lo I love fall. I love the change of the seasons and uh, fall especially. Tony, I can't wait for football season. I can't wait to be in Minnesota two weeks from today to do the show, do our football preview. It is going to be fantastic. Yeah, I am looking forward to that, have been for a while. We can't wait to have you for the first time in the studio. And, you know, I offered, uh, again, our, our futon, Leona and I's futon in our, in our living room if you want to stay with us. And we'll see if baby's going to be around then. Leona's due September 1st, so right around the time that you're going to be here, they're may or may not be the newest addition to the uh, Hernandez family. So uh, we'll, we'll see about that. Could be, it could be an exciting, uh, an exciting week in Minnesota. And Tony, the thing is, I'm driving out, I'm driving from New York to, uh, to Minnesota. So it will be fun. I haven't done that in a while. And it will be fun to travel some of the, so, so much of the country, so many states, and see parts of America. Uh, I'm going to take my time. I've got some time off from work, and I'm going to take my time on the trip and, and spend a few days just enjoying the drive out. And I'm really looking forward to that because we are fortunate to live in such a great country with so many resources and so many different, uh, all the states and the people and the cultures. And sometimes it's just fun to take the slow road and take it all in. Well, you know, know you, you know that uh, I actually rode a bike from Brooklyn, New yep. York, to St. Paul. It was right around this time. It was the year uh, 2009 is actually when I made that, that bike trip. And I purchased a 1984 Ross uh, from a gentleman in New York City and actually pedaled that bike all the way from Brooklyn, uh, New York, to St. Paul. And, and I concur uh, wholeheartedly with... You know, I learned firsthand the, the beauty of the country, which I already knew. But like you said, when you go a little bit slower, when you don't fly over the territory, you really get a different sense of how diverse the land is, uh, the various people that are out there. I, mean, I met so many great people along the way that some of them I, I still am, am friends with to this day that I actually just met in passing uh, on the road biking. So uh, drive safe, though, when you're doing that. I will. I will. I can't wait. Yeah. Two weeks, Tony. I know. Excited. It'll be, it'll be uh, great to have you here. We'll be talking about NFL football, and we'll be talking about the other things that we usually talk about on this show. Uh, speaking of that, I just wanted to, to briefly introduce what we're going to be covering on the show, and then, and then after uh, the introduction, we're going to watch a short video, a speech that uh, the actor Ashton Kutcher made at the Teen Choice Awards. And uh, Normally, we don't play those kind of videos, but he actually made a a speech that went viral uh, that has a pretty good message for uh, not only the, the younger Americans out there, but I think uh, Americans in, in general. So, uh, but we're going to be uh, talking about today is we're going to be talking about Egypt. 
everything that's happening in Egypt right now. And we're going to be talking about Hillary Clinton and uh, the 2016 presidential elections and all the issues surrounding that. Uh, we're going to hit on some local issues here in Minnesota. We're going to be talking about the special session that Governor Dayton is trying to get uh, this coming fall. Uh, we're going to be talking about the health care exchange in Minnesota and the promotions that they're going to be doing at the Minnesota State Fair. Uh, we're going to talk about the Democrat budget starting in July and how tax revenues are actually down. Uh, after the first month of the Democrat budget, uh, tax revenues are actually lower uh, than what was projected. And uh, we're going to talk about Amy Klobuchar, whether or not she's going to run for president in 2016 and how she matches up with Hillary Clinton. And then also the first transgender candidate who's running for the United States Congress is right here in Minnesota in Congressional District 2. So I think that's pretty interesting. And Rush and Snowden and Eric Holder. There's a whole bunch of topics. I'm not quite sure if we're going to uh, be able to, to get to them all here in our short hour. But uh, before we do that, we're going to uh, play a video that uh, Ashton Kutcher made. If Dallas could line that up right now. And we'll get that going. You know, I thought that uh, I... I thought that it, it might be interesting, you know, in, in Hollywood and in the industry and the stuff we do, there's a lot of like insider secrets to keeping your career going and a lot of insider secrets to, 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 to making things tick. And uh, I feel like a fraud. Uh, my name is actually not even Ashton. Ashton is my middle name. My first name's Chris. And, and it always has been, and I, it got changed when I was like 19 and I became an actor. But there were some really amazing things that I learned when I was Chris. And I wanted to share those things with you guys because I think it, it's helped me be here today. So it's really three things. The first thing is about opportunity. The second thing is about being sexy. And the third thing is about living life. So first, opportunity. I believe that opportunity looks a lot like hard work. When I was 13, I had my first job with my dad carrying shingles up to the roof. And then I got a job washing dishes at a restaurant. And then I got a job in a grocery store deli. And then I got a job in a factory sweeping Cheerio dust off the ground. And I've never had a job in my life that I was better than. I was always just lucky to have a job. And every job I had was a stepping stone to my next job. And I never quit my job until I had my next job. And so opportunities look a lot like work. Number two, being sexy. The sexiest thing in the entire world is being really smart. And being thoughtful. And being generous. Everything else is crap, I promise you. It's just crap that people try to sell to you to make you feel like less. So don't buy it. Be smart, be thoughtful, and be generous. The third thing is something that I just relearned when I was making this movie about Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs said, when you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way that it is. And that your life is to live your life inside the world and try not to get in too much trouble and maybe get an education and get a job and make some money and have a family. But life can be a lot broader than that when you realize one simple thing. And that is that everything around us that we call life was made up by people that are no smarter than you. And you can build your own things. You can build your own life that other people can live in. So build a life. Don't live one, build one. Find your opportunities, 
and always be sexy. I love you guys. So that's uh, Ashton Kutcher there, and I wanted to play that because uh, it was just relieving to see such a positive message coming from a, a celebrity, coming from a Hollywood star, and I thought that I would share that for everybody out there because it's a great message, like I said, not only for young people, for teens, uh, but also for adults alike because sometimes we get bogged down in life and you know we need to be reminded that we are all great and we have that potential to be great. And not only that, but the powers that be and the people that try to rule us are uh, pretty stupid too at the same time. So uh, we're going to bring uh, Sam on again, uh, see if we can do that. Sam, are you with us here? I'm here. What did you think of, uh, did, you, did you listen to that speech? What did you think? I, I listened intently. That was, that was great, Tony. I really enjoyed it. And I'm not the biggest uh, pop culture fan in the world. I usually don't know what's going on in, in Hollywood or certainly the Teen Choice Awards, but I think that's not just a, a great speech that he gave, but responsible because he's speaking to a younger audience. And I think it's wonderful when we have leaders, he, he's showing leadership to say, I, I liked when he said that he never felt above a job. He was always happy to have a job. And I think that although there is a youth unemployment problem in this country that's very real, um, but I think there is some entitlement amongst early 20s late teens, even 23, 24, 25 year olds that, um, that certain jobs and certain types of work are beneath them. And I think he may be hit on that in that speech. That's, that's what I interpreted at least. You know, I found, what I found really interesting too, and something that reminded me of when I was a kid is, uh, there's a deacon at Nativity grade school, Deacon Devine, uh, Jerry Devine, he was a basketball coach of mine. He's kind of a mentor of mine growing up and he told me something that I still will never forget to this day and he said Tony he's like with jobs he's like jobs are a lot like monkey bars he's like you never want to let go of, of the one bar and, uh, until you get another one and it's one of the things that he said there about having a job is you should never quit your old job until you actually have a new job because to not have a job is uh, way worse than having a job that you may not like or a job that you find undesirable. You know, I think of some of the jobs that I did when I was younger uh, that today grew, you know, feel like I grew in character because of it. I was a caddy at the Town & Country Golf Course. Uh, I was a uh, janitor at my high school at St. Thomas Academy one summer. Now, that, uh, let me tell you, that wasn't that fun of a job. I got paid $4.50 an hour worked uh, 40 plus hours a week in the summertime. I remember getting up every morning at 6 a.m., getting to St. Thomas at 7 a.m. and having to mop uh, the bathrooms and clean up garbage and crap. And, and we had to freeze gum with, with this like Freon type stuff and, and scrape it off of the lockers. And it wasn't the most fun job in the entire world, but looking back on it, it's something that in my life provided value because you learn the value of hard work, you also learn why you want to continue to go to school, and you also learn that your time is worth money in a way. So uh, the other thing I thought was pretty interesting in, in Ashton's speech was how he said, I have something to tell you. He said, I'm a fraud. He said, my name isn't really Ashton. He said, my name is Chris. And he's talking about Hollywood secrets, insider secrets. and. Uh, I would just think of how relieving that would be to hear uh, President Obama say, you know, my name really isn't Barack Obama, it's Barry Sotoro, but I don't think that we're going to uh, get to that level. But nonetheless, I thought it was uh, pretty interesting and uh, definitely thought it was uh, worthwhile to, to watch that and share that with everybody. So uh, with that, we're going to uh, play a, a clip here, Sam, because we're going to talk about some of the uh, local issues that are happening here in Minnesota for the next like 10 or 15 minutes or so. I don't know if you've been reading much about what's happening in our state, but there's kind of a lot of things uh, going on right now on a political level and a, and a taxation level. Uh, one of them is that uh, Governor Dayton, he is trying to bring in a special session to uh, provide funds for a lot of the storms that happen across the state, and they want to have an emergency session to do that. Uh, Republicans want to use a session to repeal some of the taxes 
uh, that they find onerous to the economy that are uh, destroying some of the business opportunity and business growth. And it's making news because uh, there's signs that the economy, uh, now that we have the democratic budget in line, that the economy is actually getting weaker and that businesses are complaining a lot because uh, they're having to pay uh, higher amounts in taxes. And then also probably the most alarming is that uh, the very first month of the DFL budget, the Democrat budget, actually produced uh, shortfalls in terms of income tax uh, for personal, and there was a shortfall in the corporate income tax as well, uh, which uh, some people say isn't a big deal, and, and other people say that it's a sign to come. Uh, Republicans are saying, I told you so. This is what happened when you uh, enact the Democrat budget. So. Uh, with that, we're going to uh, play another clip here that I'm going to line up, and it's from uh, KSTP, and let's see if we can find it here. Uh, where did we go here? Not here. I can't find it now. Oh, here we go. We're going to play it right now. Health Partners has affordable plans for individuals and families, like the Compass Plan, where you get a lot more for less, including unlimited free virtual visits. Shop and compare at healthpartners.com slash compass. Governor Dayton and Minnesota's Republican leaders have agreed to disagree for now. A closed-door meeting late this afternoon ended without a deal on a potential special session. There were even strong hints it might not happen at all. Or Steve Tellier sat down with some of the stakeholders who are pushing for the special session. And Steve, what do they think of all this uncertainty we're dealing with now? Leah, they say they understand how the political process works, but they also say there are pressing matters the legislature needs to tackle as soon as possible. It seems the state's top politicians might not see it that way. They met for about an hour. We're continuing to have discussions. I think they're productive. But emerged without scheduling or shelving a special session. We all are interested in the same thing. The state's top Democrats and Republicans both say they want to avoid a special session if possible. That would deny Republicans a chance to roll back the three new business-to-business -business taxes they've been pushing to repeal on repairs of equipment and machines, telecommunications equipment purchases, and warehouse services. But on Friday, Republican Senate Minority Leader David Hahn appeared okay with that. A special session is expensive, and so we're looking at if there is a way to do it without a special session, we want to fully explore that. Beth Cadoon with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce isn't interested in such exploration. We really want to fix this. We want to get these repealed. She says the new taxes are already taking a toll on the state's businesses. And it really makes it very hard for them to be able to compete with this additional cost burden. Like I said, that's not imposed in most other states. And the chamber is one of more than 350 businesses and associations that have signed a petition seeking repeal. We think we should repeal this as soon as we can because we want to make sure we have Minnesota's economy as strong as we can. But Democrats say the sticking point is how to pay for the lost revenue if those taxes are tossed out. This is going to create uh, a budget problem. So the question is kind of where would we find some new revenue to pay for those? Democrats and Republicans did agree today that if there is a special session, it would start on September 9th. Both sides say they will sit down together again next week and keep on talking. I know they want to deal with storm um, cleanup as well and paying for that. Any talk of just forgetting the tax stuff now and dealing with that during the regular session? Uh, no, that, that's basically what they're implying here. The priority yeah. is on that storm damage, right. and really that means these tax issues might not be dealt with until February. All right, we'll see what happens then, Steve. Well, right now at KSTP.com, you can take a look at that petition, Steve. So that's uh, a report there about this special session, and it, it sounds like it may not happen, and it sounds like they might actually be able to get the funds for the storm disaster relief without even having the, the session. I'm not quite sure how that will be accomplished, uh, but we'll definitely be watching this and, and seeing how everything progresses. But it just is interesting, once again, to, to see you know, the very first month that the Democrats have had their budget in place and to see the, some of the consequences that are already starting to show. Uh, that report from KSDP outlined uh, a lot of the companies that are signing petition, uh, basically protesting some of these new taxes on warehousing, the telecommunications, and others, uh, basically saying that, listen, we can move across the border and we can do our business in the Dakotas or in Wisconsin 
And uh, lawmakers uh, better pay attention to that because although our economy is slowly but surely improving, uh, the regional issues that our state faces may in the long term uh, be disastrous for job growth here in Minnesota. So uh, we got to keep our eye on that. Uh, another story that I wanted to get Sam's perspective since he's outside of the state on is uh, in at the state fair, which begins uh, pretty soon here, uh, they're going to be uh, having, and this is an unprecedented move actually, uh, but they're going to be promoting the uh, Minnesota Health Exchange, or Mensure, and they're going to be rolling it out at the state fair, and they're going to be recruiting people and really trying to educate the public about how to become involved uh, in the exchanges, and I, I just thought that was pretty interesting. It's making a, a lot of news there, and, and Sam, I'm wondering, uh, are you hearing anything, like, in terms of in New York about... Uh, the exchange is going on there, and do you think it's a good idea? The Minnesota State Fair is like the biggest uh, state fair in the country. It's one of the biggest, and uh, they're going to be having these different booths out there, and people are running around talking about the healthcare exchange and how to get involved and how to participate and how to buy into the exchange. Uh, do you think uh, that's a good idea, Sam? Yes, I, I do, Tony, because it's law becoming law. So as Obamacare becomes law and it impacts all of us, then I think the right thing to do for the federal government and the states is to get us as much information as possible so that we can make decisions. The One of the biggest challenges other than cost, I guess, with Obamacare is most of us, remember Nancy Pelosi, we need to pass the bill to find out what's in it. Um, that's just, that's so wrong. We need to know as much as we can about now the exchanges and how, if you don't have insurance from your employer, how do you get on the exchange? How do you get it? How do you make decisions? Where can you read about it? And I think an easy answer, if you don't like the Affordable Care Act, is just to say, well, let's repeal it. But that's probably not going to happen. So... As this becomes law, I think information is essential. It is, it is, and I would agree with you on, on the point where the information part is essential, but I'm a bit concerned, though, when the majority of this money is coming from grants and through the taxpayers uh, to promote and market uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, and try to persuade people versus I think what you're talking about is giving information to people so that they can make decisions. And, and to me, I mean, if you want to look at a, a good example, um, on the MinPost, I read the article in MinPost. It was dated uh, 8 13 So this is a, a fairly recent uh, article. And it's talking about the outreach effort that's going to go on. It, it claims that somewhere around $4 million is going to be spent here in Minnesota on the outreach, educating, and, and what I think probably persuading. But there's an example, there's a question and answer uh, session here in terms of, you know, it asks questions and then gives the answers. And, you know, one of the questions is, it says, will someone with a chronic health condition or an elderly person have to pay a higher premium? And the answer to that is no, which, you know, is probably, you know, so a lot of people would think that that's a, a, a pretty good thing. The thing is that I don't see anywhere in these questions or answers, uh, which is probably the type of information that's going to be going out to Minnesota, is where's the question that says, if you're a perfectly healthy young adult, male or female, uh, and you're on a, some type of a coverage, are you going to see your premium increase? And the fact of the matter is, is, is that's already happening. And so to me, it's like, yes, I agree, we need to have this information, but I question the money and the motives of the money that's going in to change people's minds. Don't you think that that's a, a risk? And you, you summed it up when, perfectly when you said it's a matter of information versus persuasion, um, federally and at the state levels. Our, our government and our politicians that stand behind the Affordable Care Act must persuade young, healthy people to sign up because they wrote it into the law that pre-existing conditions can't be held against you. And, and maybe they shouldn't, Tony. That's a really good debate. But, uh, but they're so 
that for this to work, it's so contingent on young, healthy people that maybe don't need insurance at all. Uh, so, so you're right. It is a big persuasive effort. Let's not forget that it, over the last couple of months, the Obama administration reached out to the NBA and the NFL and said, hey, can you get involved with a big marketing campaign, essentially? Because who, who cares about the NFL and the NBA? Really young, fit, active young males. <laughs> and who do they need to sign up and join? So, uh, so yeah, we're going to see instances on the state level, like in Minnesota, where, where money from tax revenues or, or grants or whatever it may be is going into these persuasion efforts to get people on the exchanges. Yeah, and, you know, I think that time is going to tell whether or not this is uh, good policy, if this is good law. Uh, we're going to be able to judge it by how much is health insurance costing middle-class families, working-class families here in Minnesota. It's also going to be judged by the quality of the care and then also the number of people that are covered. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people, and I try not to get into too many debates uh, with people. I've learned that uh, over the last uh, couple of years. I try to just more listen, engage uh, where people are standing. But a lot of young people who uh, were all for Obamacare, all for the Affordable Care Act, uh, that now realize that they have to buy into these exchanges. And when they're doing the math, uh, they're, they're looking at, okay, uh, you know, I'm a student or I have a part-time job or I'm working for a company that doesn't provide insurance. Uh, I could either continue to take the risk of not having insurance and pay the penalty to the IRS, or I can buy into the exchange, which is going to cost hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month for these young people who don't go to the doctor ever. Now, granted, there could be a catastrophe, an emergency, but that's the risk that they're taking. And what I'm hearing from people is a lot of young people who are all for the Affordable Care Act, uh, they're not buying into the exchange. And I think that that's probably uh, what's going to happen until the cost issue of uh, health insurance uh, is addressed. I agree. And I think that um, much of Affordable Care Act was, um, it sounded great, but people are, are, come, are, are having realizations now that they have to pay for it, that, that it's not so wonderful as billed. There are, there are a lot of factors, there are a lot of effects, I should say, Tony, there are, that you can read about. There are doctors uh, that are nearing retirement but probably would have worked for several more years that are leaving because uh, it's because of the regulations are too cumbersome and onerous so there are people that are leaving practices and you can read about how there are predicted shortages of doctors now because of this mm -hmm. uh, most of us that work in the private sector that have uh, insurance provided by our employers have seen our premiums not just rise, but rise dramatically. And the HR department at work will kind of cite Obamacare. And some of it may be scapegoating, but some of it's very real. I think we've talked about it on the show before in the past, but I can give you a couple examples that they gave us at work. They said, hey, when all of you out there that have 25 and 26-year-olds that joined up for insurance because Obamacare allows it, that costs money, so we're going to distribute it out to all of you employees. Uh, if you signed up for free birth control, well, guess what? It's not free. It costs money, so you're all going to pay for that free birth control through your premiums, through, through the money we take out of your check every two weeks. Yeah. So there are costs, and you, you made a great example that young people are realizing that, hey, people that are... <laughs> 50 years old and thought Obamacare was great, but their 25-year-old without a job is living in the basement and now signed up for dad's insurance, well, they're paying higher, higher premiums now, too. So it's young, old, middle-aged, we're all paying more. Well, except for, and that, that was the point that I was making by this specific question in the MinPost article, is will someone with a chronic health condition or an elderly person have to pay a higher premium? And the answer is just flatly no. Sure. So... How is that fair, though, when you're telling somebody who doesn't have chronic health problems that's young, fit, and healthy 
that they're going to have to pay higher premiums. It, it just doesn't make sense and, and it's not fair, but that's about as much as that we can talk about that particular issue. Another one that I wanted to bring up though, and I think this is uh, uh, pretty uh, historic here, is right here in Minnesota, uh, the potential second district congressional candidate, this person could be the first transgendered Minnesotan to run for the United States Congress. And uh, her name is Paula Overby. And uh, Paula Overby is a transgender woman, and she's angling to secure signatures to join a second district Democratic primary. And Overby was uh, born a man and now identifies as a woman. And uh, she believes that she'll be the first openly transgender person from Minnesota to run for Congress. There's a couple other people uh, vying for the Democratic endorsement for the DFL primary. Uh, she's one of three right now, and that's Congressman John Klein seat. Uh, Congressman Klein has held the seat for uh, about 10 years now. Uh, but I thought that that was a pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting event uh, that, she, that she is trying to do. And, you know, I'm going to see if uh, we can get Paula actually on the show because I'd love to just hear more about her potential run. And I'd also love to hear about uh, the issues that she stands for. But you, you think that's pretty historic, Sam? Yes and no. Uh, it's obviously historic. Um, but uh, I did some reading on Miss Overbay, and uh, she said that she plans to focus on reforming campaign finance and trying to prevent corporate interests from playing too much of a role in, in elections. So, and that was about all I could find as far as what she wants to run on. And the reason that I bring that up right away, Tony, is to me, uh, I don't care man, woman, transgendered, I want responsible leaders. So what I care about, and I'm not a Minnesota voter, uh, but if I was, I would say, okay, that's wonderful, and it may be historic. Uh, what do you want to do when elected? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, not to diminish the significance of it, because it is significant, but I want us as Americans to get to a point where whether it's race, gender, whatever, where we elect the best people. And yeah. we say, okay, so you're transgender, fine. Uh, what are you running on? Well said. And, uh, you know, to her defense, I don't think that she's touting that as the reason why she should get elected. No. She specifically I, said in, in the article kind of the same thing that uh, you said as well. And you know, I agree with you, though, that we have to get over, you know, this identity politics and, and get just back to the nuts and bolts of the issues. What are you going to do with the taxpayer money? What are your feelings about foreign policy and and uh, everything of that sort? So, uh, and well, Tony, yeah. Tony, can I just add, uh, if you're a Republican, some of this, non to me, it's nonsense with these social issues. If it matters to you that someone's transgender, someone supports gay marriage, or that the candidate is gay, um, it's not doing your party any favors. Um, it, it, it's splitting up your party. Some standing firm on some of these social issues from, uh, it may, to me, were a big deal 20 or 30 years ago. I think it's hurting the party. I don't, because then you end up with people in the, in this example, the, the LGBT community that have no choice but to run as a Democrat to register as a Democrat, to vote as a Democrat, because so much of the Republican community makes a big deal out of it. And if they can't let it go, it will hurt the Republicans in 2014 midterms, and it will continue to hurt them in presidential elections. Uh, and and I think we've, we've seen it already. But um, Well, no doubt about that. In, the, in 2012, the Minnesota Marriage Amendment that was put on by Republican Senate and House majority uh, without a doubt affected the outcome in many, many races across the state here in Minnesota. And it was ultimately defeated, making the state of Minnesota, I think, uh, the first of uh, Dallas. Do you know the number? It's around, was it around the first of 30 states that had a marriage put on their ballot? Minnesota was the first one to actually uh, vote it down. Uh, but there might be various uh, different reasons for that. But, uh, you know, before we get uh, too far into uh, talking about our, our national issues here, I wanted to still keep it local because uh, it was interesting that 
uh, Esme Murphy, she's a reporter for WCCO. Uh, she wrote in her blog uh, not too long ago uh, that uh, she thinks, and, and there was some report out there that uh, Minnesota's own Senator Amy Klobuchar has been put up there as uh, potential candidates for the 2016 presidential election. And, uh, you know, she wrote, uh, you know, that she, that Senator Klobuchar had actually visited Iowa. And so it has, you know, any time that a person visits Iowa and they're a potential candidate, that always brings a firestorm of rumors and everything of the sort. Uh, there's a lot of rumors that Hillary Clinton is uh, going to be uh, running in 2016. Many say that if she does, she's a shoe-in not only for the Democratic endorsement, but a shoe-in to become uh, president in 2016. Uh, but we'll have to see. Uh, but in a recent interview, though, uh, Minnesota Republican strategist Ben Golnick, he dismissed uh, uh, the idea is no Amy Klobuchar, and he said that uh, specifically. So uh, we'll have to uh, see with that. But Sam, are you familiar with uh, Senator Klobuchar at all in New York? Does she have the kind of uh, national presence no. that's needed or, or name recognition? No, but it's also it's also very early. If you ask someone this question about Governor Bill Clinton in 1989, they would probably not know a whole lot about uh, uh, former President Clinton. So uh, so it's early, and she has a chance. I, I certainly will have to, based on this news, Tony, I'm going to have to start following her on Twitter, uh, just like Governor Dayton and, and uh, Representative Bachman. And, and, and a quick uh, side note, so Minnesota has really represented itself pretty well these past few years on the national stage between Klobuchar, uh, Bachman, Palente. You guys have had some players. This is, I mean, so uh, that's good for your state. Yeah, yeah, I, I would definitely, uh, definitely agree with you on that. You know, one thing with uh, Senator Klobuchar, though, she, she claims that she has these humble beginnings, but definitely her father uh, was well-to-do. He was a big uh, reporter at the Star Tribune, and so a lot of the Klobuchar name recognition here in Minnesota uh, stems from that. So, uh, but yeah, you're right, though. There are a lot of big, uh, big hitters in Minnesota, and you know we're proud of our leaders. And even if we disagree on on certain issues, you know there's there's definitely a genuine respect on both sides of of the aisle here in Minnesota, which uh, I definitely appreciate. Of course, Congresswoman Bachman, though I think does get probably the most heat. Uh, a lot of it undeservedly so, I'd say, but, you know, people definitely uh, use her as an attack piece. She's a lightning rod, and, uh, you know, sometimes people are disrespectful to her, uh, and I think that that's too bad. I agree. Quick thing, uh, let's not, Senator Klobuchar, let's not hold it against her that she grew up somewhat well-to-do. Um, no, I wasn't, I wasn't holding it against her for that, but, you know, it's more of the fact that she kind of claims that she has these, these humble, this humble upbringing, and it, okay. it goes, you know. I just don't want to fall into um, <laughs> President Obama's trap of being too divisive about wealth and upbringing. Um, again, you know, uh, we talked about um, the candidate there in the, in the second district, that could be the first transgendered Congress person, uh, and how we shouldn't hold that against a candidate. You know, same thing when it comes to wealth. Um, too much, too much division in this country, and both sides, Republican, Democrat, or conservative, liberal, however you want to look at it, both sides, I think, Tony, play a big part in that. And, uh, you know, just look at the way the Democrats demonized Romney for wealth and success in the last presidential election. And it's just, it's completely unfair and it has nothing to do with who can be um, an adept leader. Well, you know, it's it's the media. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the, the media loves to, to have the split Democrat versus Republican, liberal versus conservative, because it, it, it helps their marketing, it helps their advertising sales, it gets people to tune in. Uh, sure. and, you know, a whole lot of other things. And I wish I would have picked up the video clip of uh, Kid Rock, who was on uh, the Piers, what's that guy's name, Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan. But Kid Rock was talking about gun control, this, that, and the other thing. And then he started talking about how in rock and roll, he, he loves his songs, or he's made his songs to rile people's passions. And, and he realized when he started dabbling a little bit in political issues, just how 
heated people and, and angry and furious people become about issues and about politics and politicians. And he said, if I would have known that, I would have started a long time ago. So, and I think there's, a, there's some truth to that. But uh, we're going to uh, uh, quickly uh, change gears here a little bit. A uh, buddy of mine, a friend of mine I went to high school with, uh, he lives in Los Angeles now. His name's uh, Charlie Kosnick, and he, he's been an actor, and he's been in uh, various movies and some ad efforts and, and things like that. But he's, uh, he has a video blog out now, and he likes to focus on political issues. And he's probably one of the few, if only, uh, conservative Republicans in the greater Los Angeles area. And I came across a video that he made, I think it was yesterday, and he uploaded it and put it on YouTube, and I watched it, and I thought it was a good video to start our conversation about uh, the 2016 elections and, and Hillary Clinton and everything surrounding that. So uh, we're going to uh, line up his uh, video here, if I can find it. Uh, let's see, here it is. And his blog is called uh, The Cause, and again, it's because of Charlie Kosnick. And uh, we're going to uh, hopefully play some more videos from him and The Cause coming up in these next shows, these next weeks and months. So. Uh, we'll line that up in Dallas if we can get that played. And more. I want it. And I'm gonna have it. Hey everybody, welcome to the Cause Report. I'm your host, Charlie Kosnick. So, Hillary Rodham Clinton's life and her pantsuits are headed to the small screen. It was just announced that NBC will be doing a made-for-TV movie about her life. I guess that's fair enough. She's first lady, senator, secretary of state. Sounds like someone worthwhile writing about. There's been some controversy about this. Like I said earlier, the movie is being made by NBC, and people are worried that NBC will make this movie a puff piece that swoons over Hillary. I have no idea where anyone would get the idea that NBC or other people in the world of media and movies would swoon. In the past few weeks alone, she has fought illness and injury, including hospitalization. She leaves her post as the most admired woman in the world. But Hillary was nothing if not resilient. She became Hillary, like Shakira or Cher. If you're Hillary Clinton, first of all, she is motivated by her passion for service. There's no question about that. This is not power with her. When I mean, you go back to the Peace Corps days, you and your wife, and that is exactly what motivates yeah. Hillary Clinton. I agree. I agree with what Andrea says. It is service. It's time, and it's historic, and it's the moment. I always tell people, if you meet her alone, like you've met her many times, she's wonderful. <laughs> I've seen Valentine's Day cards that are not that nice. The release date of this movie is also controversial because they're showing this miniseries two years from now on TV. So what could be two years from now is important? Think! Charlie, think! Oh, Justin Bieber hits puberty. No. This finally becomes Obama's economy. No, eight years is way too short. Oh! 2016 presidential election. That's right. So the NBC network, a.k.a. Nobody Beats Clinton network, is launching a flattering movie about Hillary right before the election. What's the harm in that, though, you say? I mean, come on. Our society of voters swayed by pop culture and celebrities? Never. Uh, who do I think will be, or who no, do I who want do you to want? be? Barack Obama. Oh, I love him. I find such a champion in President Obama. We've got to get out there. We have to make sure that this man stays in office. President Obama is the only choice. I'm Tom Hanks, and I want Barack Obama to be the next president of our country. <laughs> that is just so warm and fuzzy. Everything is going to be wonderful in America. Do you know how I know? Because Ava Longoria just told me so. Casting for this Hillary miniseries has also already begun. NBC has tapped Diane Lane to play Miss Clinton. Diane has yet to make a statement about her role publicly because she has been too busy writing her acceptance speeches for Emmys and Golden Globe wins she's destined to get. You see, Hollywood loves to give out awards to liberal actors playing liberal politicians, or even liberal actors playing evil, evil, evil Republican politicians. So, Diane Lane is a shoe-in, you hear it here, shoe-in for Best Actress during this award season. Oh. That is unless CBS goes forward with the Nancy Pelosi story starring Joan Rivers. Now, we are going to end the show, get very excited people, very, very exciting. We here at the Cause Report have exclusively obtained the first footage of Diane Lane as Hillary Clinton in the movie. Different. Does. Get. Make. Different. Does. Get. Make. Yeah, something tells me that line will never get into NBC's movie. But hey, that's just me. 
Make sure you go check us out at www.thecausereport.com and don't forget to share this video on Twitter and like us on Facebook. That's it for today. We'll see you next time on The Cause Report. Oh, that's uh, The Cause Report. Charlie Kosnick, a uh, friend of mine, broadcasting from Los Angeles. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for letting us share that video, and hopefully we'll be able to share some more. And uh, tell you to check him out on Twitter and share his information as well. So we're going to bring uh, Sam back on here. Sam, are you with us? Yeah, Tony, I really enjoyed your friend's acronym for NBC, Nobody Beats the Clintons. That was, uh, that was good. I like that. Um, so there's been some outrage on the social right that there's been some conservative outrage about the movie and, and he's getting at that i think in the, in the not that he's outraged but that conservatives are uh ryan's previous the rnc chairman is really upset about it and he's saying well we won't have uh our republican debates and for the 2016 election stupid um, it's it's so stupid if they want to make a movie who cares? It's fine, or miniseries, whatever it's going to be. People that that watch, that love Hillary, nothing's going to change that. And some people loathe Hillary, and they're going to watch just because she's so polarizing, and, and people pay attention. NBC, CNN, they have every right to make the miniseries or movie. Well, yeah, not, it, o not only that, Sam, and, and I agree with you, but I think the, the stupider part is why would you want to prevent Republican candidates who you're trying to build name recognition with, you're trying to persuade audiences, you're trying to get people to dialogue about the issues, why would you prevent them from broadcasting the primary debates on two major national networks? Why would you prevent them from exposing themselves to those audiences? And, and what, what do we want? The party to only <laughs> preach to the choir? And that's part of the problem with uh, Republicanism is the candidates and the party is so good at, at preaching to the choir, but in terms of outreach and getting the new voter, so poor, and just to me shows just a lack of, of forethought and a lack of intelligence. You're, uh, it, it's, uh, it's penny wise and, and pound foolish, Tony. It's, just, it's an overreaction at, it, at its worst. Now, Hillary is a topic I told you uh, off air that uh, we could probably do about 10 shows about Hillary. So uh, so that's fine. I, I actually, I welcome the movie or the miniseries, even if it is a, a big puff piece for her candidacy. Um, be before we get back, to, before we talk about Hillary some more, a side note that just struck me. What does this say for President Obama's second term that, that is he so much of a lame duck already that we're going to spend over three years of his second term talking about Hillary more than, than President Obama. And I'm sure Hillary loves that, but um, that, that just struck me right now on the air that uh, I wonder how he feels about that. I think he probably likes it because it's distracting people from a lot of the policies that are starting to be implemented right now, and it's going to distract people from some of the pain of some of the higher taxes that are being incurred, and uh, people love to talk about Hillary. So, in my viewpoint, he probably likes it. Tony, what do you, what do you think about? Sorry, I'm I'm flip flopping a little here <laughs> and, and taking your role for a second. What do you think about before we talk about Hillary 2016? What do you think about deep down inside the relationship between the Obamas? And the Clintons is it an alliance? Is it an uneasy alliance? Is it a is it a, is it a friendship? Do the Clintons have authentic friendships? What what do you think? I think that uh, it's a very uneasy relationship. I don't think that President Obama was meant to win the Democratic primary and endorsement in two thousand and eight. I think that he came in and ran on a strict anti-Bush, uh, anti-big government. Uh, anti-war campaign and he swooped in a, a large majority of the Democratic delegates and he stole the presidency from Hillary Clinton in 2008. That's what I think and I think that it's an uneasy relationship. I think she certainly views it as stolen because I think the Clintons view themselves as, as American royalty. Um, I uh, In the news 
I really enjoyed this recently in the news. President Obama recently named someone, uh, Samantha Power, to become the United States ambassador to the United Nations, replacing Susan Rice, made famous by Benghazi. Uh, not a phony scandal. Um, but anyway, Samantha, Samantha Power was in the news about this time five years ago when she was working for Senator Obama's campaign. And you may recall, she's the one who, with a reporter, she said, this is off the record, but Hillary Clinton is an absolute monster. She will, she will stoop to anything, any level of deceit to win a campaign. Samantha Power quickly had to resign and retract her statement and save face for the Obama campaign. But I, I think she was, at the time, in 2008, right on. I agreed with everything she said that she didn't want to be said publicly. And I think it's interesting now that Hillary Clinton has left the Obama administration, <laughs> that President Obama named Samantha Power to uh, such an important position. Um, but I think that is indicative of how the Obamas felt about the Clintons at the time and probably now. And for the viewers of your show, they might wonder, well, why then would he put Hillary Clinton in as Secretary of State? And I, I read some really interesting stuff, Tony, that President Obama and the people around him, some of whom are very smart, encouraged him to do so because the Clintons, if he hadn't, would have ran Hillary for president on the Democratic primary in 2012, which is exceptionally rare for an incumbent to face, to have to go through a primary process. But people around President Obama said you might want to include her in your cabinet so that you don't, it, what if this economy is really bad and you can't fix it in four years and then you get beat in a primary as a standing president, that's not very good for legacy. No, I, I don't think that that's, uh, that's ever happened, actually. And that's, a, that's an interesting point. And uh, I wanted to show you something, too, where I do believe that a potential Clinton for president campaign might run into a couple stumbling blocks or two. Uh, namely, I think that uh, his name is Anthony Weiner. And I wanted to uh, actually play this clip because I found it to be uh, pretty interesting. Uh, if I can find it here, where is it? Gosh, I have too many of these clips here, I tell you, that sometimes I can't find them. Uh, where is it? Uh, maybe, I didn't, uh, maybe I didn't send it over. Shoot. I think it's near the bottom of your email. Uh, maybe it's not here. But uh, basically, though, you know, there was an there was a interview with Anthony Weiner where he perhaps uh, spilled the beans in terms of the, the presidency and, and Clinton's uh, campaign. Uh, but, you know, I thought that that was uh, something uh, worth noting because, as you know, uh, Huma, his wife, and that scandal, the Clintons are very close to Anthony Weiner, and they were behind his campaign and behind their marriage and everything of that sort. And uh, I thought that was interesting. But uh, we're going to end here, uh, Sam, on a, on a lighter note. I wanted to play... Uh, this video, it's from Texas, and it's a, a hippie family. People were having trouble with their land. They're, they're landowners, property owners. They had their own sustainable farm on there, growing tomatoes and other types of food. And uh, the FBI or the police recently raided their property, and I just wanted to, to show this because uh, they thought that they were growing marijuana on their property, and it turns out they're just tomato farmers. Uh, but is this a sign of what's to come here in America? It was a two-punch operation from Arlington Code Enforcement and police to clean up a property and a search for drugs. Well, tonight the homeowner is asking questions, calling the raid on her house an abuse of authority. Channel 8's Monica Diaz has that story for us. The gate at the Garden of Eden, a place that preaches a sustainable lifestyle, remains broken. Evidence left behind from a raid. They came here under the guise that we were doing a drug trafficking growing and a marijuana growing and trafficking operation. Suspicions laid out in the search warrant obtained by Arlington PD and signed by a judge. The SWAT team went to the property on Mansfield Cardinal Road to execute it two Fridays ago. They found nothing. Not a single thing. Arlington PD says it conducted the operation with dignity, professionalism and respect. Quinn Aker disagrees. He says eight adults inside were handcuffed, 
during the operation, and there was no reason for the raid. Well, I think that every single right we have, have was violated, every single one. Code enforcement teams also went to the home. They hauled nearly 21,000 pounds of materials, including 24 tires, filled with stagnant water. Smith says Code took away their food and everything they need for a sustainable lifestyle. There's probably 15 or 20 um, blackberry bushes. There was um, some flowers, which we use for not only our bees, but for, you know, just gifting. We had um, lots of okra, and we had a sweet potato patch that they walked down with a weed, weed eater. The city says it has received numerous violations since 2011 about the property, and that the owner refuses to make changes. The purpose was to improve the quality of life, to resolve life safety issues within neighborhoods, and to hold the property owner responsible for creating blight conditions on their property. Smith was fighting the city but says she wanted to reach an agreement, but never expected it would end like this. We want an apology. In Arlington, Monica Diaz, Channel 8 News. I know they're local authorities, and I read deeper into the article, and they found one of the reasons why they were initially investigated is because they had a website up that used what the uh, police thought were buzzwords for growing marijuana. It turned out they used words like uh, growing a, a dank garden and some other uh, verbiage that uh, is very ambiguous. It might be, you know, lingo for hippies or, or whatever, but uh, I thought it was interesting, too, that the police defended their actions, stating that they were uh, acting respectfully, that they did it in an orderly, cooperative fashion, and like somehow that justified them to uh, go to into their house and destroy their garden and handcuff them and, and search the entire place. This is on their private property, and uh, I don't know. I just thought that that was uh, fairly remarkable, and uh, you know I hope that it's not a sign of things to come, but. Uh, what do you think about that, Sam? Did you hear what was going on there? Uh, it, sound, it sounds like two, two observations, Tony. One, uh, so they think they're extracting buzzwords from a website. Now, maybe this is just a local outfit, and, and that's why it was such a screw job. But on the national level, that's some of what the NSA is supposed to be doing, you know, big, big data and what's out there in the cloud and what are they analyzing. So. Yeah. Even if you're not familiar with this local screw job to this family, um, this is the kind of thing that do you you know do, you, do we have to be worried because we send emails back and forth that have two that say terrorists too many times? Um, well, that's exactly that's a great point that you bring up because wh what I hear a lot of from people is they're like, well, I I don't care if the NSA is listening to my phone calls, I don't care if the government is monitoring my emails, I'm not doing anything wrong, I'm not breaking any laws, I'm not a terrorist. Well, you never know how certain words are going to be interpreted and, you know, as like the gentleman stated, he said, my rights were being infringed, we weren't doing anything wrong, and the police came onto their property, ripped out their garden, they handcuffed them, they searched their entire place, destroyed food that they were growing uh, for themselves, and uh, you know, is that they weren't doing anything what, wrong there. And Tony, what happens if you're a small business owner and these uh, local authorities in their infinite wisdom decide that you're a front business for, for marijuana or whatever they assume you're doing, and they come handcuff you uh, in front of an important customer? <laughs> you're innocent. <laughs> you get exonerated, but the customer still sees you get handcuffed and says, eh, something not quite on the up and up with that shop, and what did they do? The, the, and then who is responsible for that lost business or revenue or, or the damage that was done? Maybe you get exonerated, but um, but it, it could be worse than just your garden. It could be your business. It could be your livelihood, your property. Yep, yep, you're right. It's a big cost of uh, big government and big government spying. But, uh, Sam, we're at the end of our show here, and I'd like to thank you for joining us, Sam, and I can't wait till you're here in the studio, and thank all of you. For watching the Tony Hernandez show, we broadcast live every Saturday, SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. We replay on our YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios. <laughs>